Welcome to another episode of Echoed Words Reviews, our first in a while. Um, things have just been hectic. Uh, life, work, I've been having to go down to LA uh, back and forth a couple times. Uh, I started working on my pilot's license for fun, uh, got a haircut, and um, yeah, just, just in general, a lot of things have uh, started hitting towards the end of the year, not giving me a lot of time to do reviews. But we are back. Uh, and I have been reading in the interim, so I have quite, uh, I have a lot of catch-up to do. Uh, I just finished Madame Bovary yesterday and started on Don Carpenter's Hard Rain Falling. The book that we're going to be talking about today, Stoner, by John Williams, I think is a great book to ease back into the swing of things. Uh, get us out of that sort of genre space where we left off with the, the more horror stuff in, uh, October, and get back into the realm of, I'm loath to say it, but actual literature. And to that end, I think you're hard-pressed to find a better book than Stoner uh, to sort of ease you in or, or dip your toes into the wonderful world of literature. I do think that this is a great sort of gateway drug into actual lit. So with all that said, let's stop talking in vagaries and start talking about the book itself. Brandy on a cold day out of a china cup is one of life's unsung pleasures. Stoner is a book by American author John Williams. No relation to the John Williams that you probably think of when you hear that name. I'd use his music as a sting here, but then I think that some rough and tumble enforcers from The Mouse would come and break my kneecaps. Uh, but originally published in 1965, it was well received critically, but didn't sell hardly any copies. I think it sold like 1,500 or 1,700. It was not a lot. Uh, and then I think it was republished a few times, like once in 1973, whatever. Uh, we now get it in the form of a NYRB, New York Review of Books, uh, publication. I have to say it has been a struggle to not just do video after video of NYRB titles because they publish such good stuff. Uh, a Month in the Country, probably my favorite book I've read this year from them. Uh, Hard Rain Falling that I'm reading now from them. The Peregrine by J.A. Baker from them, etc., etc. Uh, and so if you haven't checked out New York Review of Books, which I, I highly doubt if you're watching this channel, I assume that you at least know who they are, I would check them out. Also, their book club is a great deal. I think it's like 12 bucks a month and you get one book every month from them. And that is, uh, that's a deal. Uh, it's definitely, definitely worth it. Stoner is, at its core, the life story of an, for all intents and purposes, unremarkable man named William Stoner. Somebody who, on paper, doesn't achieve much in life, who never attains a rank higher than assistant professor of the university that he studied at. And the book sets this up right from the get-go, saying, quite savagely, an occasional student who comes upon the name may wonder idly who William Stoner was, but he seldom pursues his curiosity beyond a casual question. Stoner's colleagues, who held him in no particular esteem when he was alive, speak of him rarely now. To the older ones, his name is a reminder of the end that awaits them all, and to the younger ones, it is merely a sound which evokes no sense of the past and no identity with which they can associate themselves or their careers." which seems like a brutal takedown of this man. And it kind of sets you up to look at this person with pity. But as you can imagine, this book is about so much more than that. Uh, it's a book about work. It's a book about self-sacrifice. It's a book about living a fulfilling life, even if you don't achieve much. It's a perfect book to inspire a reevaluation of your own values especially if you live in a goal-oriented society like ours. Otherwise, it wouldn't have achieved the level of fame and, and renown that it has now. Uh, there are so many, so many threads on, on Reddit and elsewhere about how this may be the most underrated book of all time, which sort of begs the question how much praise you can heap on a book and, and how many people can call it underrated before the book becomes properly rated. This book enjoys an astounding level of acclaim since NYRB republished it, so I wouldn't go so far as to say that it is an underrated book. It's a very popular book now. But not to get sidetracked, so the book has one of the greatest, almost misdirections, I would say. Not 
plot-wise. There's very little plot in this book. In fact, there will be spoilers in this review, but, I mean, if you're reading Stoner for the plot, you're, that's, that's not why you would read this book. It is entirely a character study. Um, but the beauty of the book is the, in this misdirection, right when you feel like you understand who William Stoner is, and, and right when you may be about to sort of check out. I know I was. I, about midway through, I found myself thinking, is this all there is to the book? I, it's kind of cliche. I know who this character is. I get it. Uh, but then the book hits you with this great switch, and you realize that William Stoner has led a beautiful and blessed life. One that is on the surface unaccomplished, and one that you may not find yourself envying in any way, shape, or form, but one that is nevertheless a good life. And to appreciate that, you have to put everything, the characters, in the context of the time, uh, which the book does remarkably well. Uh, so the story starts with Stoner being born on a farm to dirt, dirt, dirt poor parents, uh, in Missouri in the late 1800s. Uh, a university, the University of Missouri, opens up near them, and his pa kind of encourages William to enroll, to study agriculture, to come back and help out the farm. Things go sideways, though, because this passionless person, this sort of very passive, wishy-washy, uncommitted person, falls in love with English literature at the university. Now, I'm not saying he has a talent for it, but he falls in love with it. And this is the first stroke of passion that this character has had. And he decides to abandon the future that was laid out for him and, and go his own way. And this is an important moment because I think this is one of maybe three decisions that William Stoner takes in the, the course of the novel. Maybe he does four, but I think that there are three decisions that he makes in the course of this book. And the rest of the time, he's a very passive character. He himself is not taking control of his life. So he decides to stay at the university to study English literature. One thing leads to another, and he finds himself devoting his life to academia, uh, becoming a, a faculty member of the college. This book has some autobiographical elements from John Williams' own life. Uh, he himself was in academia. Uh, he also studied, I think, the same stuff that, that Will Stoner teaches, which is like classic literature. Uh, there's a lot of talk of Dante, Shakespeare, etc. All stuff that goes over my head because I'm a big dummy. Later on, Will Stoner meets a woman that he becomes infatuated with, and after a very short and awkward courtship, they get married. Uh, from the get-go, the marriage is a disaster. His wife holds him in contempt for her blaming him, not unrightly so, but her blaming him for the fact that she never got to see Europe and didn't live the life that she wanted. She wasn't able to accomplish the goals that she had set out for herself. They have a daughter who is neglected for the first few years of her life by her mother before being weaponized by the mom uh, as leverage and a way to, to make Will Stoner miserable as the relationship falters. Through this all, Stoner tries to work on a book. I think he publishes one and then he begins writing another one. Uh, but it's never anything that he gives himself wholeheartedly to, uh, at least until he meets another woman, a student of his, whom he begins having an affair with. And in a kind of funny twist of irony, when he starts having the affair, his wife finds out and she's happy about it, and it actually inspires some civility in their relationship. The bliss is short-lived, however, and after flying close to the sun and having his wings clipped, uh, Stoner sort of resigns himself to living a quiet life, one that doesn't leave much of a wake behind it. So why is the book so good? Why did it have me ugly crying by the time that I finished it? Which is 100% true. I finished this book weeping, full-on weeping. Uh, and that has never really happened to me before in reading anything. This book affected me on such a visceral level. And I think that that's because of how it's written. Its style is very direct. John Williams does not spare any of his characters uh, a critical eye. But it's hard to articulate it, and it's hard to put that style into words because it's not that he holds his characters in contempt. He just has enough respect for them to treat them without kid gloves and to tell us and describe them to us, the reader, in brutally, brutally honest terms, the good and the bad. 
about Stoner's wife, Edith, Williams writes, as he got to know her better, he learned more of her childhood, and he came to realize that it was typical of that of most of the girls of her time and circumstance. She was educated upon the premise that she would be protected from the gross events that life might thrust her way, and upon the premise that she had no other duty than to be a graceful and accomplished accessory to that protection, since she belonged to a social and economic class to which protection was an almost sacred obligation. She attended private schools for girls where she learned to read, write, and to do simple arithmetic. In her leisure, she was encouraged to do needlepoint, to play the piano, to paint watercolors, and to discuss some of the more gentle works of literature. She was also instructed in matters of dress, carriage, ladylike diction, and morality. Her moral training, both at the schools she attended and at home, was negative in nature, prohibitive in intent, and almost entirely sexual. The sexuality, however, was indirect and unacknowledged. Therefore, it suffused every other part of her education, which received most of its energy from that recessive and unspoken moral force. She learned that she would have duties toward her husband and family and that she must fulfill them. Her childhood was an exceedingly formal one, even the most ordinary moments of family life. Her parents behaved toward each other with a distant courtesy. Edith never saw pass between them the spontaneous warmth of either anger or love. Anger was days of courteous silence, and love was a word of courteous endearment. She was an only child, and loneliness was one of the earliest conditions of her life. So she grew up with a frail talent in the more genteel arts, and no knowledge of the necessity of living from day to day. Her needlepoint was delicate and useless. She painted misty landscapes of thin watercolor washes, and she played the piano with a forceless but precise hand, yet she was ignorant of her own bodily functions. She had never been alone to care for her own self one day of her life, nor could it ever have occurred to her that she might become responsible for the well-being of another. Her life was invariable, like a low hum, and it was watched over by her mother, who, when Edith was a child, would sit for hours watching her paint her pictures or play her piano, as if no other occupation were possible for either of them. Edith becomes an antagonist in the story, or at least an antagonistic force. However, Williams does such a good job of contextualizing her that it's hard not to understand where she's coming from, even when you do really fucking dislike her. Uh, she becomes a very unlikable character. But then again, so is Stoner. He is not charismatic. He is not this, you know, lovable person. He is detached. He is stoic. He is distant. He will not stand up for himself. He is kind of a, a pitiable character. However, he is a character that John Williams has said is a hero. According to him, this story, this little story about a nothing man who doesn't accomplish much in his life, is a story of heroism. I am not fully convinced that that's true. To me, that sounds like a nice, marketable logline. Uh, but I wouldn't go so far as to call Will Stoner a hero. I think he's a man who, at the end of his days, can look back and, and has, in his own way, lived a fulfilled life but I don't think that he's necessarily a hero. So I've said it a few times, but what I mean when I say that you have to put the characters in context is that this book, while not really telling much of a story, is almost epic in scope. It encompasses the First World War. It encompasses the Great Depression. It encompasses the Second World War in the 1950s. It tells a story in which there is action, world-changing action, happening in the peripherals. However, as the story is set in the world of academia, and our character has tenure, he is unaffected, at least materially, by everything happening around him. And that is the key point of characterization for Will Stoner, and why his life is not a failure. Because while the rest of the world is either getting shot and dying, or starving to death, can't find work, or then re-enlisting to go back to fight another bloody war, all his worries are or about his curriculum and teaching students and continuing on his studies and continuing in higher education. And the best passage of the book, in my mind, lays this out explicitly. But William Stoner knew of the world in a way that few of his younger colleagues could understand. Deep in him, beneath his memory, was the knowledge of hardship and hunger and endurance and pain. Though he seldom thought of his early years on the Boonville farm, 
There was always near his consciousness the blood knowledge of his inheritance, given to him by his forefathers whose lives were obscure and hard and stoical, and whose common ethic was to present to an oppressive world faces that were expressionless and hard and bleak. And though he looked upon them with apparent impassivity, he was aware of the times in which he lived. During that decade, when many men's faces found a permanent hardness and bleakness, as if they looked upon an abyss, William Stoner, to whom that expression was as familiar as the air he walked in, saw the signs of a general despair he had known since he was a boy. He saw good men go down into a slow decline of hopelessness, broken as their vision of a decent life was broken. He saw them walking aimlessly upon the streets, their eyes empty like shards of broken glass. He saw them walk up to back doors with the bitter pride of men who go to their executions and beg for the bread that would allow them to beg again. And he saw men, who had once walked erect in their own identities, look at him with envy and hatred for the poor security he enjoyed as a tenured employee of an institution that somehow could not fail. He did not give voice to this awareness, but the knowledge of common misery touched him and changed him in ways that were hidden deep from the public view, and a quiet sadness for the common plight was never far beneath any moment of his living. That is just beautiful writing. It is beautiful writing that understands the human condition. It characterizes and contextualizes Will Stoner as somebody who, up until then, at least I thought he was just very aloof, but it showed that he had an awareness for his position in life, and he appreciated it and cherished it. That passage is also beautiful to me and, and works in such a nuanced way because it finds this correlation between the, the manual labor of his forefathers and the intellectual labor that Will Stoner finds himself doing in the present day. Many other books would try to apply a sort of moral scale to those two types of work, where there's the, the honest, tangible, material tilling of the field, plowing the earth, uh, hewing wood, and then the sort of more worthless, intangible, uh, intellectual pursuits that only come in a, you know, society of splendor. However, this book shows that at their core, they are the same. And that work, no matter what it is, labor, always requires self-sacrifice, a sort of martyrdom in a way. Whereas in the case of William's parents on the farm, it took their health and their life as backbreaking labor. For William, in the world of academia, it took his dignity, his self-respect, knowing what battles to pick and choose in order to continue on doing what it was that he decided to devote himself to doing. And there is just a quiet, contemplative beauty to that, in my opinion. And is why this book, to me, reaches far greater heights than you would initially assume based on its subject matter. But despite being so grounded in realism and the, the quiet, slow moments of life, the book at times also strives for high-minded literary symbolism that's grand in scale. Uh, chiefly, one of the things that stuck out to me is uh, one of the first things he notices when he goes to university as a student are these five pillars. And at a couple other crucial moments throughout his career and throughout the story, he finds himself staring and overcome by what these pillars are that he has to walk through to get into the campus. And, you know, pillars are a very common symbol going back hundreds, if not thousands of years. Originally used to symbolize like a gateway that takes you from this, you know, base, foul, material world to a more perfect, divine world. However, that symbol got turned on its head and corrupted, if you will, in the Divine Comedy by Dante. Uh, in Canto 26, when Dante and Virgil meet Ulysses, uh, who is in hell because he's punished for going beyond the pillars of Hercules. Uh, he's punished as an act of hubris for going where no mortal should go. And I bring up Inferno because that text plays a major role in the story of Stoner. So I don't think it's any coincidence that these pillars play such a big role uh, at very crucial moments of the story. And I think John Williams is very aware, as a student of classical literature, of what those pillars mean. And I do think that he's using them kind of ironically as a way to denote a gateway that this, you know, 
poor farmhand maybe shouldn't have crossed into and a world that he doesn't belong into and he's being punished for it. Another way to view the pillars is in the Masonic symbolism of uh, the, the twin pillars of Boaz and Joachim being cut down, symbolizing a man cut down in his prime, whether sexually or physically or spiritually. Uh, and in the case of William Stoner, maybe all, maybe all three. And that's another thing that I think was really deftly done is how the meaning of certain things, and we'll, we'll use these pillars as an example, but how the meaning of them evolves as Stoner grows and becomes a different person. And I think there's something really profound in that, how whether it is a fellow person or a book or a film or a song, whatever, these things can take different meanings, maybe evolved meanings or maybe completely dialectically opposed meanings, uh, depending on where you are in life. Now, I'm not sure if that's what the intent of all of this is, but whether you believe in death of the author or whether you just want to, uh, you know, puff up John Williams for being an incredibly intelligent and well-read and, and profound writer, which is the way that I see it, uh, I, I think that there is a bit of that going on in the text. So who should read Stoner? Um, I think if you love literature, or if you want to read literature, if you currently are reading, you know, genre, sci-fi, YA, fantasy, but have that desire to, to start reading, you know, actual literature, which I fucking hate saying, but if you find yourself in that, in that boat, I think that this is a great book to start with. Uh, it is written so plainly, so directly. There's very, very little fluff, if any. And yet it does such a beautiful job characterizing everybody that's in the book in such an easy and digestible way. This is 100% where I would start, and, and I'd, I'd say is a, a, the gateway drug to, uh, to real literature. If you are somebody who has goals in life that you are not sure you'll ever accomplish, and that is weighing on you. I think this is a, a great book as well. One reviewer said that this book should be required reading for the entitled generation. And I think what they meant by that is that this book is invaluable to people who misguidedly believe that life and that the world owes them the actualization of goals that they have set for themselves. This book does an incredible job of making a case that you can still live a fulfilled, worthwhile life, even if you don't accomplish much. And I think that's very important, especially as, you know, as a species, we've now eclipsed 8 billion people. It's 8 billion people who want to, you know, who each have dreams and hopes and aspirations and who are more likely than not going to end up crushed under the weight of failure. I think that this book is invaluable to recenter yourself. And, and tell yourself that it's okay. Your life does not have to be defined by the deeds that you do. Posterity is a luxury, not table stakes as we've been led to believe. And if you're still unconvinced and you need more recommendations, uh, the blurbs in here put it in very simple terms that uh, I agree wholeheartedly with. The most beautiful book in the world. Stoner is achingly sad yet somehow inspiring. I don't think I've ever encountered a novelist in such complete control of his voice and characters. The best quiet book I've ever read, and the most heartbreaking. So that is Stoner by John Williams. A remarkable book, but now it comes time to see how sticky it is. Uh, and what I mean by that, if you haven't seen this before, is where we take all of the passages that stuck out to me. This is a purely subjective uh, uh, litmus test here, one that is in no way indicative of a book's quality or lack thereof, but we take uh, the total number of pages divided by uh, how many of the stickies, uh, how many passages stuck out to me, uh, and then we get a stickiness rating on our stickometer here. And for this book, it is... I haven't done the math yet, so give me one second. So Stoner is 278 pages. There were 32 passages that stuck out to me, which gives us a stickiness rating of 8.68, rounded up to 8.7. Definitely deserves it whatever it is. So that's about it for today. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video and liked Stoner, if you've read it, leave a like, 
drop a comment, let me know what you thought about it. Uh, if you didn't like the book, let me know. And if you didn't like this video, feel free to leave a dislike and drop a comment telling me what I can do better in the future. Well, all right, thanks again so much, and uh, we'll see you next time, which will hopefully not be as far into the future uh, as this one was. I won't make you guys wait another two months. All right, thanks, bye.